Hi, everybody. <laughs> I hope you're liking the show. Um, I'm Jack Ferver. My piece is next. I tore my calf last Sunday in rehearsal, so I'm not really going to be dancing in mine. I had to cut that choreography. I'm going to be giving you more like uh, Mariah Carey. Um, Mariah Carey now. Um, uh, but uh, Reed wanted me to come out and get these paillettes so that we didn't <laughs> step on them. Um, they kind of hurt. Um, what else? Oh, I have a work premiering. Um, it'll be at New York Live Arts, April 4th through 7th. Um, I'm in it. And James Whiteside from American Ballet Theater and Lloyd Knight from Martha Graham and Garen Scribner from like everything and Reed, of course, I mean Reed always has to be in my work and um, because we went to arts high school together and um, he, him and Harry will be designing it because they're the best, duh, that's why we're here. Um, I think I got them all. Um, mm, I'm going to take one last look. Cool. Um, what else? Well, you know, enjoy the pieces, like, watch them, and, you know, see what you see, and, um, feel, you know, how you feel. Reed, Harriet, I need you to make me something for this gala. This is what you made me for the Bessies. I didn't win, but I was the best dressed. So, what do you got? Ooh, Lame. Love. Good. See the picture? Are you wearing it backwards? <laughs> yes, I did. I'm glad you didn't put it on backwards tonight. A fox. Oh, I love foxes. I want one as a pet. Um, I just want to put it out there for those of you watching this that if you haven't read Deleuze or Roland Barthes' Pleasure of the Text or um, Goodnight Moon uh, or ever played Hungry Hungry Hippos that, um, you know, this might be confusing for you, but that's okay because sometimes art's confusing. I mean, What's that big metal silver pizza piece? <laughs> Wait, you guys, stop. Stop. I wore this to the PS122 gala. I don't want to wear it again, so I need to wear something else. Oh, what is it? It's um. Oh, it's an octopus. Cute. I love that. <sighs> I had this really shitty couples therapist, and he said that in every relationship, there's a turtle and an octopus, and that I was an octopus and my boyfriend was a turtle, and I needed to learn to give him space. Well, I really gave that bitch space when I broke up with him, and I found all the photos I could of us in the apartment and burned them in the bathtub. You know, that couples therapist, he was so stupid. He cried when I terminated our sessions, and I was like, this is my breakup. Like, 
Why are you crying? You're the therapist. Hold the space. Get a boundary. I should be a therapist. I think I'd be good at it. This is depressing me. I don't want to wear it. <laughs> Do you get it? I'll just take this moment to plug my show at New York Live Arts. It's um, <laughs> April 4th through 7th. And, um, you know, check it out. Do you get it? Yeah. OK. Ugh. Dolphin. People are always like, dolphins are my spirit animal. And I'm like, really? Dolphins are crazy. They masturbate in front of each other. They assault people. But they're also kind of smart. Because they'll be like, ow, ow, I tore my calf. And then they'll sink towards the bottom of the ocean, pretending to be injured, to lure a shark towards them, who's like, ooh, fierce, easy prey. And as the shark gets closer to the dolphin, the dolphin whips around and is like, gotcha, I'm fine. And then they call all their friends and family, and they beat that shark to death. Dolphins are pretty fierce. <laughs> Dolphins are cunt. <sighs> Take it easy. No need to rush. We have plenty of time. I feel like it's been like, you know, seven minutes. Oh, good. Yeah, just careful with my injury. <sighs> Do you get it? No. Good. Mm-hmm. Good. Oh, Russell, you're so strong. <laughs> Arm hole. Oh, okay. I did it. <sighs> and 100. 200. 300, 400, 500 people are killed every year by hippos, which is kind of amazing because they're vegetarians. Um, hippo, H, I, P, P, O. I saw this video that someone took of it said antelope being saved by hippo, question mark. And the antelope was in this like mud puddle and it couldn't get out. And these hyenas had come to eat the antelope, but it was by this hippo and her baby. And the hippo charges in and scares those hyenas away. And you're like, oh my god, that hippo saved that antelope. But then the antelope can't get out of the mud. And it's just stuck there. And the hyenas come back to it. And so it's really bothering the hippo and her baby. And the hippo's like, I am over this. And she charges in and shakes the antelope to death and then throws it up to the hyenas. And when I saw that, I thought, I get it. Top, bottom, I'm twisted. <sighs> All right. There was a woman running through the forest being pursued by tigers. Bring that mic closer to me. And um, she got to a cliff's edge, and there was a vine there. And she started climbing down the vine, but she saw there were tigers below her. So she started climbing back up the vine. But she saw at the top of the vine a mouse was chewing it, and that the tigers had arrived. She also saw to her right a beautiful clump of strawberries growing out of the cliff's face. She looked above to the tigers, below to the tigers, to the mouse chewing the top of the vine. And she thoroughly enjoyed a strawberry. Ladies and gentlemen and other, Reed's and my friend from arts boarding school, Tiffany. Thank you. 
That was beautiful. Thanks.
Hi, I, I am Adrian Dechigwaring. Um, I will be moderating a panel now. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to invite Reed and Harriet back out, and Jack, and Burr, and Gwen Welliver. Thank you. <laughs> and Laura is here as well. And Lauren Lubavitch as well. Great. <laughs> Okay, so um, given what you've just done, what we've just seen, uh, I have no questions that pertain to the whole evening except maybe this one to start, which is, can you, can you talk us through sort of your uh, design philosophy? Do you have an aesthetic philosophy that you feel is applicable to this whole poo-poo uh, platter? that you've offered up this evening? Um, this is always a hard question for us when people are like, what, what would you say is your like, mode of operation in terms of aesthetics? And so generally, Harry and I are like, well, we, we work sort of in minimalism, but that's not, it's not the right word. But I think what we aspire to do inside of our work is be really direct. So we, we try to edit in a way that gets points across really clearly. That's all I can say. And do you feel like that, that intention translates into the way you communicate with collaborators, with choreographers? Actually, I'll ask the choreographers this. Um, maybe start. I'm sure we'll all have a different yeah. answer. Yeah. What is the question? The question is, <laughs> do you feel that the directness, which Reed and Harriet strive for in their design practice, translates into the way they they communicate with you in the collaborative process. Absolutely. I mean, I, I feel that, I mean, in, in my way of, I can only speak to my way of working with them, though Reed is one of my best friends who I've known forever, so it's, I've certainly heard about their process with other choreographers, but for me, there's something that I see and then I tell Reed and Harriet what it is, and then they make it better than I originally saw it. So I'll have a vision for something like, um, I, I want to use Shamb as the example, actually, because in Shamb I wanted to have, which was based on Jean Genet's The Maids, and I wanted to have these maids costumes, but I said, there's, they're a skin, they're, they're a skin, they're a second skin, they're translucent, I'm, I'm seeing these maids costumes that are made out of skin, and uh, they were these Parisian maids costumes that you could see through, so it always betrayed the gender of, of me and the other man who were playing these maids and um, created this kind of gross vulnerability, which is what I, which was the intention of it, and it was just made way better from the, my original uh, verbal prompt on it. Gwen, could you speak a little bit to this and, and the evolution of the work we just saw? Well, in terms of Directness. Am I on? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll often bring an image or two uh, to Reed and Harriet, and um, I love how quickly you, you'll say, "Well, I just think it needs to be this," or you'll ha you'll immediately understand what in the image or what um, what in the image makes sense for the work. Glen Girl Gallery, when I uh, first, the first piece that you designed for um, in 2010 or 11 or something, one, what we did was, um, there was, in the choreography, there was a progression from very casual movement to, to uh, much more architectural linear forms. And so we did this in the costuming as well. And the way you handled that was we started in very casual warm up clothes and then just started pasting things on um, uh, bit by bit. And so I had this fantastic white dicky collar with a little bow that we just pasted on. So there was a transformation happening in my eye through a ge geometric form, which is something that I love about your work. They're often really clean. So we just had this semicircle, but it was a dicky collar. And so we knew something was happening, but, <laughs> but we don't know. And, and I love that, that leap in the imagination, um, hopefully for the viewer uh, with each added part or with each additional costume. Um, yeah. 
going to pass the torch down. All right. Um, I think that um, Reed and Harriet are shapeshifters. Um, they have very strong ideas, and when they're confronted with a choreographer who has no idea what they want, they can supply a very strong and very lucid vision. Uh, and um, then there's the opposite side, where they have to be totally self-effacing and be willing to be humble enough to accept that they're working with a choreographer who has a very complete vision of how they want the work to look. I'm afraid I'm the latter. <laughs> and, and when I speak to um, Reed and Harriet, they don't give up anything. <laughs> they're, they're very, very simply put together, listening to what I've got to say. And uh, in this particular duet, um, it's a piece premiering a little later in April that, uh, that uh, uh, Reed developed the costumes of all the I had not seen those costumes before yesterday. So this was uh, a situation where they completely took a hand in what the aesthetic of the piece would be and came up with that. First thing I said to Reed was, I would never have the courage to put that in my dance if it weren't for you. So um, these designers have a great deal of courage to offer if one can take advantage of it. What was the question? <laughs> Sorry. It's getting, it's getting twisted as we go down the line, which is like a game of telephone. But I, I'm just curious as to sort of the nature of the dialogue you have with Reed and Harriet when you're in pre-production for something like what we just saw and how, how direct that language is. I think every time I've worked with them, we've had a different dialogue prior to starting to actually work on anything. So sometimes I'll, I'll make a dance and I like have it all planned out and I know what I want. And then other times it's kind of like, well, what do you guys want to work on? With this one, I was really, um, I feel like I wanted to give them an opportunity to kind of they were giving me such an opportunity, of course, but like I also want to say, like, okay, what do you guys want to work on? Like, what needs, what do you need to like complete the evening? So, it kind of goes both ways. For this, I I came up with like a pretty specific idea, and then that idea transformed into something else. And since your since your piece is the sort of freshest in our in our eyes right now, I'm curious as to what the the unfolding sort of timeline was in which the choreography came into existence, in which the costumes came into existence and how those two things informed each other. I'm shooting from the hip here. I'm, I think that, will you, will you talk about that? Okay, <laughs> I'm so tired, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so tired. <laughs> um, for this piece that Burr did, um, he came up to us with just ideas about silhouette. So it wasn't a clear visual thing or a color, nothing like that. He just kind of, although you did say one color, but one he, color. yeah, he said oxblood and he wanted to progress, <laughs> progress through um, different silhouettes. He wanted to start with very form fitting into very voluminous. And I think you guys saw that with the um, kind of pleather bodysuits into the more floaty uh, habutai, silk habutai colorful bags. So he came to us with that idea. We kind of took it into what you saw. And basically, we started with the unitard that's very form fitting. We wanted the middle, um, the progression to then go into those neon jumpsuits with a little bit of crispness, crisp, crispness and structure into these more organic silk bags, as we call them. And we started bringing samples of different of the shapes of the pieces in really early in the process, so it could inform what the dance would become, because each of those pieces has certain limitations. So with Burr, because this process was so uh, new and this whole thing came about only in the last couple months. It gave us an opportunity to have like a really collaborative, collaborative costume and dance. <laughs> <laughs> Ori originally, there were going to be um, fans placed around the space that would blow the silk b bags around, but then it turns out that the fans didn't really work, so we cut them. But the idea was that like gradually. Uh, the, the circulation of air in the room would increase, so the costumes would start really tight, and by the end of the, by the end of the dance, we'd be dancing pretty slowly, but the costumes would be moving a lot. But 
that'll be the next dance. Yeah. So full on Louis Fuller. Sort of, not quite. To some extent. And how about uh, the, the color palette in those bags? I've been wondering what to call them, but I'm glad you offered up this word. In these bags. Those colors are related to something we want to do later with Matthew Neenan, which is a project related to color pairings. So we just stared at all these bolts of silk in a store, and we were like, which colors look interesting next to each other? And then that's how that happened. <laughs> because I noticed in the, in the costumes for Pam's piece, the, the first uh, work that we saw, that the top of Harriet's costume had almost what looked like a Pantone colorways. Like, so we like to make jokes, inside jokes with Pam for her costumes. And so the crazy pattern costumes that I was wearing and Stuart Singer was wearing um, are from scrap pieces from her other piece, Quadrille. Um, we just took scrap pieces and kind of refurbished them into costumes for this piece. And the print is actually based on the carpet at um, the Joyce. Yeah, because Lar, Lar commissioned that piece for a program he invented at the Joyce Theater, and Pam was like, I want to use the rug. So we looked at the rug, and we had it printed, and what you're seeing on Harriet is actually uh, a color strike off, so it still has, like, you know, colors for us to make matching decisions on her chest. Okay. And then the second costumes in the second duet in that piece had a collage of images of past works? Past Pam works that we've designed for her. <laughs> so it's very self-referential. Yeah, we did, a, we did a piece at Ballet Austin recently where we, where, I don't know why we did that. Body of work. Body of work. Body of work. And so we had an enormous hunk of yardage printed with these huge blown up images and what Maggie is wearing is a scrap from that, and what I'm wearing is the strike off, which has much smaller images. Thumbnails. Thumbnails. Okay, cute. Um, and then moving on in the program, what came next? Next was Lars' piece with the paillettes. And Lar, you saw these paillettes for the first time, and do you think that they'll stay in your joy season, your 50th anniversary <laughs> season? No. <laughs> And since you sort of indicated that you like to give a very clear design brief when working with costume designers, do you have already in your head what those costumes will become? Well, I, I spoke to Harriet uh, uh, briefly yesterday, and I spoke to Riedel before, and I really just gave them things like um, um, the weather conditions and the time of night, um, and um, a, a kind of a palette. I just said it had to be... Um, very without embellishment, because my work has a lot of embellishment, but that it had to reflect something like mist coming off of water. Now we'll see where they go with that. There was a little more information than I gave them yesterday. That was, that was wow. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. But, but that wouldn't be appropriate for the entire dance. I thought they were beautiful for the duet out of context. The, the larger dance um, has five people in several sections, and, and the paillettes falling over the floor might be a problem. <laughs> Understandable. So do you guys feel in some ways that this commission was a, a laboratory for you to push the boundaries of your design practice, of your manufacturing practice, and in what ways have you developed new techniques or ways of working on what we saw tonight? I think it, it wasn't about the production process or developing new ways of manufacturing, I think is the word you use. Because you guys did make all these costumes. We did, we did. But this was kind of us figuring out the next phase of Reed and Harriet as costume designers. I think we want to be a little more, more than that. We, you know, we don't want to just be commissioned to design costumes for choreographers, but maybe that we can direct something and kind of, uh, you know, decide on the whole, the whole, the direction, the production, the costumes, and the, f yeah, I have no right. word. It was an experiment in, into what does it mean Reed and Harry design as the production designers total. So, uh, we- Art directors. Right, we work in service of other people quite a lot. 
and we'll still do that. That's our bread and butter, but we'd like to have more of this process in our art making. So that's how that happened. And also, in terms of manufacturing, we uh, we can make clothes, sort of, but like we've seen how people can really make clothes. So like we didn't, we weren't that ambitious. With I mean, they look good, whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, but you know what I mean. They're simple. Like we weren't going to be making corsets or anything. Mm -hmm. You guys, they were nice. It's fine. <laughs> well, I know you had a, a fellowship recently at the Center for Ballet and the Arts that was very much driven by this intention. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we, we, we wanted to know what it felt like to, uh, to design the sets, costumes, and direct the story of a full-length ballet. So we thought it would be appropriate in the context of Center for Ballet and the Arts to fulfill that task. So we decided to do the Nutcracker, because it's popular, and then we made up our own version of the story through reading and history, and then we got to do all the design tasks, and it was really, um, it was really fun and also really challenging for us and exercised like a part of our brain that we don't generally use, which is like spatial things. So that's, that was great for us. And they've also generously given us studio space to build this show as well. So it's, they've been really kind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> I mean, because in a way, this reads as a blank canvas, right? And you guys are kind of, I mean, from my vantage point, it's like you're exploding your practice out in a new way, as opposed to conforming to the, the parameters of, of your design briefs or the assignments you get. Um, and that's thrilling. We like that. Yeah. <laughs> it reads beautifully. I'm trying not to impose my like self-interpretation onto these works, and so I'd rather just hear maybe from, from Jack, where you're coming from with what I mean, saw. I think the thing that I find really exceptional about them as artists is, first of all, they, they work with so many different choreographers and who are going to ask from them so many different things. And actually what was exciting about looking at the designs for Nutcracker was actually seeing how rooted they also are in dramaturgy, in theater, in storytelling, um, which are, are certainly in the heart of my practice. and. So to see them, uh, I, and I've seen so many of their designs from, I mean, I can think of like, I've seen like a Beth Gill piece and a, like a Justin Peck piece and a Lar and, and there are so, and each of those are contextually in the scheme of dance very different. And how Reed and Harriet are able to come to these incredibly different planets and grow these amazing gardens it speaks volumes to them as artists. They're the real deal. And I, I, I think in listening to you last night uh, speak also so um, uh, eloquently about your work and your practice was for me as someone who's known you both, I mean you a really long time and you actually also feels like a really long time now. I'm tired too. Um, <laughs> is, uh, was, is incredibly moving because I think um, artists can really get focused into a, a singular position and um, uh, to see people who are able to maneuver across so many different landscapes, which Lara brought up earlier, is uh, genius. Jack, thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. I mean it. So I'm thinking about this language that you're all kind of throwing out about landscapes and atmosphere and, and sort of giving this sense of what universe you want to create in this stage space. Um, and I'm wondering if you two, in approaching this commission for the Works in Process, had a sense of an overarching universe you wanted to create. Or was it a sort of a, a best of playlist? Because to me, at times, it felt like the opening ceremony of the Olympics and a high school reunion. Um, and I'm wondering if those are mistaken. I mean, it's all ideas that we've wanted to explore that we haven't been able to explore inside of other people's work. So we've imposed these ideas onto, onto other people's work. Um, <laughs> say. But um, I guess the, whole, the overarching theme of the show was different kinds of collaboration. So in each case with a choreographer, we're receiving the piece in a very different way. Jack made a new dance. Gwen sort of reinvented an old dance. Lar gave us a dance which hasn't premiered yet, which is made up of 
of a kind of history of movement that I'm very familiar with. And then Burr made us a brand new piece and Pam made us an, another brand new piece. But um, in each case, we explored a different way of communicating with that choreographer. So with Jack, Jack comes to us with very clear ideas and then doesn't involve himself in what that actually looks like. So he says, I want a hippopotamus, I want a tiger, I want an octopus, I want a dolphin. And so that's great. And then we get to explore what does that mean on a bodysuit? Like how does that look? How how two dimensional is that? Or what kind of palette do we want to use? And and he gener he seems happy with it. I'm always happy with it. However, on this one you were like, and we're gonna make this super sheer one with a couple paillettes on and have you yeah, crawl out you on that. the stage. And I was like, fierce. We needed a broom. Yeah. I'll be, you know, washerwoman. Yeah. Yeah. That idea didn't come from you? No. no, that was them. That was, you know, Reed, Reed and I have fun. <laughs> Can you tell us about how when, it changed? Yes, let me try my best. Uh, <laughs> so we, des um, we designed Gwen's piece, What a Horse, a couple years, many years ago, 2015. Um, and for this, for the show today, um, because it was sort of a, choreographically, it was kind of a, copy of that old piece, but like a carbon copy where things are a little shifted, it's not perfect, um, things have been a little changed, so we decided let's do the same with the costumes. And so we took the original patterns of the previous, the first initial piece and um, made it out of sort of paper-like fabric and did sort of a rough make of them and so, just like the piece today, the costumes are also sort of a shifted copy of the original costumes. And how did the piece itself shift? How did the choreography change from its 2015 iteration to now? The, the entire piece, What a Horse, was primarily a, a duet um, danced by the heroic Stuart Singer and Claire Westby. And at one point, there was a trio that, that the two of them and I had built, and we were, we, I didn't want to perform, and they were, um, um, they, the, the dance was, was very dense and um, um, very demanding, and they, they were talking about, like, they felt like workhorses, and we said, well, we need a show horse. Let's call Reed. So, so, so Reed. So the beautiful thing is he had been designing costumes. Reed and Harry had been designing costumes. But then I love that when you work, when you have the chance to work with someone for a long time, that they can get involved in other ways. So, so that was the you danced in that trio, the central trio of the du, of the longer duet. So now to answer your question, what we did is we took only um, we only Reed and Stewart's role. Um, of the trio, and when you meet, when you remove one person from the form, that's a dramatic shift, and um, and so you have two people, and they actually and they care for one another very much. They're old friends, and they 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 just the the material shifted immediately the way they looked at one another and the way they wanted to do the gesture. I even watched from each performance to the next; it shifted further and further and further. And I love that. Um, so, uh, and then um, we did bring Harriet out um, at the end um, to come in with a bit of Claire's material uh, to join in to then let you move and, and to um, uh, progress in the evening. Did I get that answer? Yeah. Yeah, it was like... Just trying to get as much information it's out really of you as different. I can. It's really different from the original, um, but uh, we did start with that, that material verbatim um, and just watched it watched it change. It, that brought up, I mean, in, in hearing about like the show Horace and Reed, I, tonight while I was watching it, I, was, I thought, wow, you're in every piece tonight. Mm. And um, yeah. it's another thing that I, that I feel is so essential about them as costume designers is Reed has also danced for so many different people. I mean, he's done ballet to uh, performance art pieces and galleries. I mean, it's, it, it, to read his dance bio, it's hard for me to think of dancers who've done all of that, actually, who have that ballet facility and, and like, come from that training and then go all the way to the other end of the spectrum. Um, 
And so to, I think that all of that is inside of these designs, as well as, I mean, and then there's Harriet's design eye. I remember asking early on when the two of you were working together, and I was like, How, well, what is it? This is just as you and Harriet were starting to meet. And you talked about her innate uh, quality with color, that she, you were like, she has this understanding of color that is profound. And so to see this duet, I'll, to think of designers who come, who have a background of it, it's, I can't, I literally can't think of anyone else. Yeah, Harry also has like relentlessly specific ideas about proportion. So as soon as she sees someone, I just look at her face and she's like, no. So it happens really quickly, which is nice for me because sometimes I'm like, it could be good. And she's like, absolutely not. So, you know, it's good. It reigns me in. And do you in some way feel like you have strengths where the other person has weaknesses and there's a health in that? Yeah, I th we, we divvy up things, but the core of the design process is really balanced. We, we participate in the fundamentals equally, and then it's sort of the extraneous things where we divide responsibilities, because I, um, I can't deal with money, and Harriet does that. <laughs> So all the so the fun part of designing and coming up with the concepts and the ideas we do together, and then all the boring part like sewing and pattern making and emails we divide. Yeah. Whichever one we hate less, we're like, okay, you yeah. do that. I'd rather make a pattern than right. write a check. I'll, you know. I'll do money and I'll write some emails sometimes. Yeah. I, mean, so, I don't mean to stereotype here, but I understand. You know, Reed is coming from a dance background. And Science what you're describing, mind. and and Harriet is coming well, from molec molecular cell biology. Well, I have a visual arts background and a science background. <laughs> Can you turn off the science brain? <laughs> and you also have, uh, 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 to me, until a few days ago, unknown history as a dancer. I just found out today that I used to do Korean traditional dance. I did it for seven years. I didn't know that. You know, because you do it as a child, a kid. <laughs> My mom told me today. Childhood blackout. Childhood blackout happens to us all. Seven years. That's like kind of long. That's a long time. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know. I thought it was one year or two. You know, when yeah. you're a kid. Seven. Don't all your cells regenerate every seven years? <laughs> I should know that, but I don't. <laughs> Can we talk about the music? Yes. Yes. Shall we go down the line and talk specifically about how choreographic ideas related to musical ideas? Well, I will just say that from the inception of the show, I, I, I said to Harriet, I was like, it'd be really nice if Tiffany could be the glue of the show, because she's an old friend of mine from high school and someone that I have a massive respect for. And I was like, I would like her to participate in any or all of the pieces. And then I, I sort of approached each choreographer and said, this amazing thing is available. Would you like something from her? And then that's, that people came with all different ideas about what they'd like her to sing. And she tackled a million, well, four different, very different pieces of music. One million. Um, four. I love hyperbole the most. Um, but yeah, Tiffany Renee Aubin, everybody. And Patrick Gallagher. Patrick Gallagher. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Patrick Gallagher accompanied her, and we've loved him for so many years, and I forgot. And so talk to us about this dress that they're sharing. Well, I, well initially I was really like, this is going to be the best gag. And I wanted the dress to go all the way around backstage to the choir loft. And then we tried it, it didn't work. So then we shortened and it's cute. <laughs> it's cute. It's funny, right? There's a great sense of connection there. So the music for you functioned as this sort of uh, framework as you conceived of this evening? The show is sort of all over the place, yeah, and it was that. a nice thing to bring to just one constant. Yeah. 
And how do you feel that each choreographic um, sort of gesture resides in your body in relation to the next, having danced in each one of these pieces? Can you say that one more time? I'm so sorry. How does it feel to dance this work? I mean, how, what's the embodied experience of, of this evening? Um, if, how did it feel different in each dance? <laughs> <laughs> She's asleep. Um, Pam's felt, made me nervous because it was specific and... Unison. Yeah, there was specificity and um, a beat versus Gwen's felt very sort of, there was room to, you know, change things or mess it up a little and it'll be okay. Um, and actually Jax also felt, you know, it was very specific and there was a lot of timing involved. Um, but yeah, it was all, I, and, and Burr's was just, just be crazy. That was, that was what he told me, so that was easy. <laughs> There's a kind of trajectory through the show where there is a specific way that, y you need, that I need to approach each work, but um, generally, like, as long as I remember to drop my pelvic floor, everything's gonna be okay. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, I mean, get, once I get through Lars' piece, I feel like everything's going to be okay. There's just this kind of like hyper, um, there's this way of it needing to be really connected that you can't, uh, you can't sacrifice that or the whole thing gets lost. So I feel a, a great pressure inside of that. Um, and with Lars' work, I used to perform the same things so many times that it would become like breathing, but this piece is still a little bit new to me, so I'm still a little bit like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, but I went well. Um, <laughs> um, and then, like on the op, like Gwen's piece has a very conversational rhythm, and movement-wise, it is very specific, um, and certainly the most sophisticated physically. So that's the one that learning it was the most uh, taxing, because I was learning a video of an improvisation that Gwen Welliver did, and it was like learning. <laughs> who? Stuart Singer said it really well. It was like learning uh, a video of a bag of mayonnaise falling down the stairs. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Very fine movement. All some, it's all someone else's bodies. Yeah, patterns. not my body. <laughs> it's so true. Does that mean it's over? It's getting to... <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. you guys.